Yo, we out here. I'm the Buff Missionary. Welcome back to the channel. If it's your first time here, go ahead, like, subscribe, share, hit that bell. You know how it is. You know how it rolls. I appreciate the support. Thank you for those who have done it so far. It helps the videos get out there and to share the gospel and the mission to more people. And that's the whole point. That's what we're trying to do out here. So thanks. I appreciate it. Hey, if this is your first time checking in as well, we're continuing through the book Steps to Christ. We're in chapter three, still about halfway through. And it's just going to get better and better from here. I know I keep saying that, but that's because it's true. But hey, I don't want to take too long with all that stuff. Let's jump right in. You who in heart long for something better than this world can give, recognize this longing as the voice of God to your soul. Man, <laughs> that's, that's such a deep line right there. How many people, how many of us have felt like no matter what we get, no matter how much we achieve, no matter all the things that end up coming our way that are good, we still feel like we're missing something. And there's that one little piece. We can't always put our finger on it, but we just know that what we have is not enough. And it's, it's frustrating because we'll spend time seeking after those things and wondering why there isn't the level of satisfaction at the end of all of our pursuits that we thought would be there when we first started. There's that little thing that's missing and we struggle with that. If you're longing for something better than this world can give, recognize this longing as the voice of God speaking to your soul. Oof, it's powerful. It's powerful. Ask him to give you repentance, to reveal Christ to you in his infinite love, in his perfect purity, in the Savior's life, the principles of God's law, love to God and love to man, were perfectly exemplified. Benevolence, unselfish love was the life of his soul. It is as we behold him, as the light from our Savior falls upon us, that we see the sinfulness of our own hearts. There's a great irony in the fact that, you know, I'll use uh, the gym, for example. All right. I like to work out. It's not where the name Buff came from, but don't worry about it. Everybody uses it these days. You know what I'm saying? It is what it is. But how many of you have ever posed in your bathroom mirror? or a mirror that's in your house. Or you look by, you walk by and you just catch a, a glimpse of yourself. And you're like, oh man, I look good. <laughs> and you get caught up feeling yourself, right? And then you, you feel confident, you're excited about that, and then you go to the gym and you see everybody else. And immediately, you're not thinking the same thoughts that you thought when you walked past the mirror in your own house. You're thinking, man, look at what that guy has. Look at what this girl has. And you, tr you immediately measure yourself against the other people. And it can be a bad thing for sure. It can be a good thing too, depending on how you use the motivation. It works both ways. But the point is that when all we do is look at ourselves, we can appear really good. But if we want to see how we really measure up as a person, we have to look to someone bigger than us, beyond us, better than us, and that's Christ, especially in the sense of our sin. You know, being a Christian, it's so, I don't know what the word is, but one of the big issues that I see, and I've talked about it before, and it's going to keep on coming up again because it's true, and we struggle with this, but one of the issues that I see is that we do a really good job keeping up with the forms and the, the practices, the standard on surface level and what people see when they first look at us. All right. We'll show up to church. We'll be there on time. Shoot. We'll even be there all day, <laughs> whether we like it or not. But we won't express that to anyone. Our heart is not in it, but we're there because we want to keep up with the Joneses. We want to keep up with everyone else who thinks, well, if this person isn't showing up, then they must not be a good Christian. So we volunteer for things we don't want to do when our hearts are not in it because we're trying to keep up with appearances because we're trying to put out there that we're such a good Christian. And this ties in again to the whole idea of hypocrisy, where people look at the things that we profess and that we claim, and then they see us being something completely different 
And they're like, well, clearly this whole good news and gospel you're talking about isn't changing you. So why would I want anything to do with that? You know what I'm saying? And we just, we get caught up just in the wrong area. Looking at all these forms and things and assuming that that's what Jesus wants when all he really wants is a relationship with us. And the thing is for you to truly connect to someone. You guys know how it is in your practical experience with the people you've tried to become friends with. How many of you have been able to have a great friendship with someone on a superficial level? It doesn't work. You might, you might put a certain image out there to get what you want in that moment, but it never lasts long. And you're never able to get everything you want out of it by putting on that facade because people want something that's real. I've dealt with people like that and I've been that person at times. I'm sure people have cut me off because of coming across as fake and disingenuous. And there's people that I've cut off because I'm like, you know what, I don't have time for that. Like this is surface level and I'm looking for something deeper. We've been there on both sides. I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about here. But when we look at who Jesus really is, we see that benevolence. We see the unselfish love that was the life of his soul. We see the light from him and we're able to see, oh, shoot, that's what it really looks like in this room. (laughs) I was putting up, I got some uh, sound paneling in here, trying out a different audio setup to try to just get just get a better product out there. Never mind all my stuttering out here. But the point is, I. If you were to see every other aspect of the room besides what's in the frame, you know what? It's okay. I'm open enough to show it to you. So we have all these panels on the floor. Uh, You can see it's incomplete over here on this side. (laughs) We got a little bit going on, but it's not quite there yet. And so a lot of times as Christians, we stick in this frame. And this is the only thing I want you to see. And I don't want you to see any any other corner of my life because that might be too dirty and it might be too polluted. But when you turn the lights on, then you see everything that's around here. Then Christ is able to illuminate and help us to recognize, wait a second, you're not as clean as you think you are. You're not as pure and as holy as you think you are. I'll take it a step further. A lot of times for Christians, we end up comparing ourselves to the other Christians that we're around. Who's a better Christian? That's what the disciples did. Who's, who's the best out of the disciples? Never mind that they're all following the same God. <laughs> right? They're sitting there worried about each other and who's the best out of everyone there because that was their circle. And that was all they were able to look at. But once Jesus called it out, that's when they kind of realized, wait a second, maybe we need to look more towards him And realize that, oh, let's stop looking at ourselves, stop focusing on ourselves, and get back to what the mission is supposed to be about. What the purpose for us following Christ is supposed to be. We can't do that if we stay focused on ourselves. I'll go with another story. I meant to hit up my dad earlier today. But there's a... (laughs) This is funny, I'm putting it out there, but hey man. Uncut, unfiltered, this is how the buff missionary rolls, alright? I was talking with him a while ago about a church that he's been attending... Uh, since my parents moved down to Tennessee. And he was talking to me about some of the politicking and some of the issues that they have there and how this guy is doing this and that guy is saying that and this guy, is belie- his beliefs are like this even though there's an understanding to a different direction. And I, I ultimately told him, man, you need to get out of that church because <laughs> they're not doing anything good for you because they're so caught up in who they are that they're missing the point. I told him that. And I wanted to call him last night to remind him not to go back. And I meant to call him this afternoon to tell him to, to, to check and see if he had gone back or not. I didn't get a chance to yet. I'm gonna hit him up after this. So uh, stay tuned. I'll let you know in the next video. <laughs> but again, even my dad realized when I asked him, like, what, what do you see the church doing on the outside of the church? There's a whole lot of seminars. There's a lot of meetings. There's a lot of things where the people inside are together all the time, whether it's in a, uh, an evangelistic series or something, just a discussion. And they engage with each other all the time, so much so that the rest of the mission is not being expressed. 
And because they're surrounded with other people who look like them, think like them, and act like them, they think they're all good. They think everything's okay. Totally missing the point. We can't afford to do that as people who believe in Jesus. Like, we owe it to the belief that we claim to get out of that comfort zone and to go out into the community to be a light to others. Not so that we can be the ones to tell them all the stuff that they're doing wrong. That's not the point. The point is we show them a relationship with Jesus and how it changes our lives and let people's curiosity take it from there. It's a little bit different than how we usually approach witnessing and mission within Christianity and Adventism. But I think it's something that's necessary because you can really turn people off so fast when you come in trying to act like you're the light, like I'm the light, and I'm showing you all the stuff you're doing wrong and the things you need to change or you're going to hell. I hate that. I absolutely hate that. But it's what we do. We come in pretending to be the light when it's Jesus who is the light. And we're just supposed to point them, point people in the direction of Jesus. We're not supposed to point out all the stuff like that. That's not our job. Anyways, Nicodemus, great example of this. Nicodemus was a Pharisee in Christ's time. It says, we may have flattered ourselves as did Nicodemus that our life has been upright, our moral character is correct, and think that we don't need to humble our hearts before God. We're good. Everything's cool. And we especially don't need to do what the common sinner needs to do. Why should I? Look at me. I'm a Christian. I'm an Adventist. I follow Jesus. I'm in church every day at, the, at 11 a.m. For, for divine service. I pay my tithes. I'm dressed up with a suit and tie. <laughs> we do this on the outside. But when the light from Christ shines into our souls, we shall see how impure we are. We shall discern the selfishness of motive. Why do we do the things we do? Again, again like I said, more often than not, Christians are doing these things not even for their own benefit and edification, but to try to keep up with everyone else and to try to mask the reality of our own souls. That's what we do. That's why a lot of the world thinks we're hypocrites and has no interest in hearing what we have to say. And I can't be mad at them for that. We see the enmity against God. We see where we really stand against God because we're, we're going into this spirituality focusing on other people and how we measure up to them instead of looking at Jesus and seeing how we all fall short of his glory. We see these dirty things that have defiled every act of our life. Then we shall know that our righteousness is indeed as filthy rags. That's one of the things the Bible says, and we miss that. Somehow we think that we can... <laughs> I, I have to laugh at it because somehow we Christians think that we can be good. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's not about me trying to be more clean than the next person and be better than the next person. That's completely outside of what the gospel is supposed to be. All of us fall short. It doesn't matter how good society deems us or how poor and, and broke society deems us. We all fall short. That means the most devout Christian and the most devout atheist are on the same page when it comes to their righteousness. It's all as filthy rags. But we don't want to hear that. We don't want to approach life like that. Instead, the Christian wants to say, I'm better than the atheist because I believe in God. I beg to differ. Then we shall know that the blood of Christ alone can cleanse us from the defilement of sin and renew our hearts in his own likeness. The likeness of Christ created in the image of God, which was to do what? To share. To share what he had with someone. That's what happened at creation. God is love. God wanted to share his love. God had power. He wanted to share his power. He creates humanity and creates them with the divine command to share, to be fruitful, to multiply, and to share the things that they had been given from him with everyone else. When Jesus came, it was the same thing. He had been given a message, a truth. He shared it 
with the disciples. He gave them the power that was given to him so that they could go out and share the message the same way that he was doing. That's what it's always been about. You never hear Jesus going around talking about how much better he was than anybody else. You don't hear it. Why do we hear that from Christians today? <laughs> one ray of the glory of God, one gleam of the purity of Christ penetrating the soul makes every spot of defilement painfully distinct and lays bare the deformity and defects of the human character. It makes apparent the unhallowed desires, the infidelity of the heart, the impurity of the lips. The sinner's acts of disloyalty and making void the law of God are exposed to his sight, and his spirit is stricken and afflicted under the surging influence of the Spirit of God. He loathes himself as he views the pure, spotless character of Christ. But that's exactly where we need to be. It's like, <laughs> I'm thinking of, of a hospital scenario, right? Where people who have injuries and broken limbs and take, take you can use DeMar Hamlin, for example, right? Let's say that for some reason he goes, he collapses on the field. And he gets up and he's still somewhat conscious and people are trying to come and help him because they see something's wrong and he's like no 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 get off me I'm good I don't need your help if that were the case and that happened what kind of situation do you think he would be in right now I thank God it went the opposite way and he's still here with us why because he was accepting of the help when he woke up and was able to communicate with his family and communicate with his teammates his response wasn't, what are you guys doing here and why, why am I in the hospital? You didn't hear any of that. You heard gratitude <laughs> and care for his team and, and what he thought they were still in the midst of. He was looking forward for the help. He was appreciative of the help because he knew that's what was going to put him in the best position for his life. And it did. Thank God for the responders who responded so quickly. It saved his life. And he's grateful for that. But when you look at it in the spiritual sense, a lot of times we're walking around with spiritual injuries, with sin in our lives, things that we're trying to hide, and we're dodging the light. We don't want to see the light because we don't want to be exposed as if it's all oh, the other people who are sinners and all this kind of stuff, they're going to look at us and be like, oh, so they're not perfect. Well, bump that. When again, the reality is <laughs> every single person falls short of the glory of God. We're all the same. And we do better for ourselves when we can admit it and accept the fact and accept the help as opposed to trying to reject it and refuse it. As Christians, we have to do better. Look, be re being real with, with you guys, there's a lot more people from what I've seen in the world who can acknowledge their faults and are comfortable with their faults and, and who they really are. There's a lot of people out there who are putting on a facade and trying to save face and trying to keep up with the Joneses too, for sure. But if I'm comparing the people who are more comfortable with who they really are and their imperfections, I believe that I see more people more comfortable with that stuff outside of the church than inside. And the irony is that those who are inside the church and who have Jesus who they know and believe and claim, maybe is the best word to use there, that he can save them from their sin, they're the ones hiding from it the most. What kind of sense does that make? It's backwards. It's backwards. And get this. If Christians, the ones who are professedly and supposedly closer to Christ, are not comfortable coming to Christ to see their sin and, and their uh, issues and to get help with that, why would somebody outside the church be interested in something like that? They look inside and they see the fear that a lot of Christians operate within, and they don't want anything to do with that. And again, I'm not mad at them for that. I get it. It's not on them for rejecting a message that professes hope, but presents itself in fear. That's on the Christians. That's on those who believe 
who claim to believe in a God who can save and yet act like they're scared of the God who can save. Doesn't make any sense. <sighs> I'm going to stop there for today. I, that's, that's enough for me to think about because even as I'm going through these paragraphs, I'm telling you, there's, there's like a, a cutting knife that I feel going inside me, realizing that, yeah, I'm sitting here and I'm saying this to you all through YouTube or the podcast, but there's a lot that I need to adjust in my own experience. I read a quote in another book earlier this morning that said, who the man is, is more important and more influential than what he says. Who a man is and woman is more influential than what that person says. And I'll be honest with you. I could do a better job of repenting. I could do a better job of acknowledging my faults and my errors, my, my errors, my mistakes. I can do a better job of really asking God for help to change my patterns and my habits so I can get a better result, a different result. I need to, I need to let go. A lot of us don't want to let go because we like the things that we like. We like to do the things we like to do. Y'all know how it is. But we have to let go of that control and give God a chance to help us to change. Otherwise, we'll just be the same. And we can listen to this great and inspiring text and read through it and appreciate it. And oh man, that sounds amazing. And never put it into practice and never get the benefit for it. I don't want that to be me. Which means I have a lot of work to do. I have a lot of submission to do. And I hope that you don't want that to be you either. So we'll stop there for today. I think, I think that's solid. Once again, it's the Buff Missionary. Thanks for tuning in. Like, subscribe, share, hit the bell. Comment down below your thoughts. Anything is welcome. For, against, in favor of, rejecting of, whatever it is. If it makes you excited, if it makes you upset, share, please. Let's start the conversation and, you know, let's, let's embrace the dialogue. So, it's Buff Missionary. We out here and we out. Peace.